Welcome back, everybody. Uh, recall that in this snippet, we're switching our attention from the GNSS orbits to the GNSS signals. I'd like to begin by uh, reviewing a couple of basic things. First, I want to talk about the L-band and why that's so special for GNSS and really all the signals are located there. And then second, I want to talk about frequency domain descriptions of the GNSS signals. Uh, you will see over and over again uh, in the discussion of GNSS uh, a function that's called the sync function or sine x over x. For all the world, it looks like boom, with little side lobes going out from the side of it. And it's really important that you know where that comes from. So in this snippet, I'm just going to talk about L-band, get you a little bit oriented. Already talked about it a little bit. And in the next snippet, 3.6, we'll talk about that sine x over x ever-present function that describes the frequency domain of the GNSS signals. So recall, our signal structure looks like this. And uh, we've talked about this before, but we have three pieces. Each time a satellite sends a signal, it's sending at least three strands of information at you. One is the carrier, this creature that exists up here at the top. Modulated on top of that is the code. And then finally, the most slow, patient process is the navigation data that appears down here at the bottom. And we'd like to uh, talk about these three pieces differently. Let's start with the carrier where we have the two descriptions. One is the so-called wavelength from here to here. I'll clean up here a little bit. Given the symbol lambda, and it's equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. Please hang on to this relationship. It is so important in uh, GNSS. Speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The frequencies are given over here on the left. If we're talking about one of the signals at L1, let's say GPS CA code, then the frequency is 1575.42 times 10 to the sixth. If you take that number and you divide it into three times 10 to the eighth, you'll get 0 0.19 meters, the wavelength of the GPS signal. So <clears throat> often, when we're thinking and talking about the GNSS signal, we'll just uh, write down its frequency. That tends to be the thing that people talk about first and foremost. But always in the back of their mind, they know they can translate that from that to the wavelength. As we've talked about earlier, the frequency is that count or that rate that you could establish if somehow you could just stand and watch a sine wave go by as it propagated by. How many peaks or how many cycles will go by in a second? In the case of GPS L1, it's 1.57542 billion cycles per second. The wavelength is that thing which if you could freeze the radio wave, just get it to stop, and then walked along it with a tape measure and measured the distance from peak to peak. That would be the 19 centimeters. And fortunately, those two things are related by this relationship in the upper right here. Lambda is equal to C divided by F. So let's talk about the import of 1575.42 or 1227. Remember how to read this logarithmic spectrum chart that we introduced earlier. This is 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6. So that means GPS L1 resides right about there. GPS L2 is 1227, so it resides right about there. GPS L5 is 1176, so it resides right about there. And that's where they live in the radio spectrum. Why was that such a good choice? And by the way, it's a phenomenally good choice for, for GNSS. So much of the good of what that system has done 
resides from these choices for the frequencies. This chart is nice because it shows the value of the L band. Think of it as showing the opacity of our atmosphere, our Earth's atmosphere, as a function of the frequency of the radio waves that try and go through. So think about this as going up in frequency in this direction and up in wavelength in this direction. Remember, they have that inverse relationship, lambda is equal to c divided by f. So these are waves with very, very long uh, wavelengths, but very, very low frequencies. Up here, the wavelengths are tiny. They can be subvisible, and uh, the frequency is very high. More or less in the middle of that resides this sweet neighborhood here, which begins, let's say, at 100 megahertz and goes up to around 20 gigahertz or so. That is prime real estate for satellite because the atmosphere is transparent at those frequencies. As you try and go too low in frequency, the ionosphere that we've talked about a little bit that does delay the GPS signals, but it doesn't block them. If you go down too low in frequency, not only does it delay the signals, it just simply blocks them so they don't come through. As you go up in frequency, the waves become more and more sensitive to rain and absorption in the atmosphere. And so the atmospheric gases, water, oxygen, and so forth simply absor absorb the waves, either trying to get up through the atmosphere or down from the satellites to the Earth's surface. So in here, is this sweet zone that we call L-band. There were a couple of other considerations. If we were to have gone lower, we would still have gotten through the atmosphere, but our ionospheric delay, remember we notated it capital I, would be getting larger and larger. And it's a difficult thing to model. So as it gets larger and larger, it begins to become more and more problematic. In addition, if we went down in this direction, man-made noise also tends to get higher. So we'll have more difficulty from uh, uh, ground-based radio systems. In contrast, if we go up in this direction, ionospheric delay becomes smaller, but it becomes more and more difficult to use very, very small user antennas. So if you're interested in the details of that issue, uh, take a look at the link budgets in some of the references that we've given you, the link budgets for GPS. And in addition, as we move up in this direction, you become more and more sensitive to rain. So we wanted an all-weather navigation system. In fact, you need your navigation system mostly when it's rainy. And so uh, going up into a frequency band that was rain sensitive didn't make sense. So when we come back next, we'll talk about the frequency domain. We'll talk about those sine x over x functions that I've uh, foreshadowed for you. And I, I look forward to talking to you then.